Hey, welcome to episode one of Experiencing the Expansive, this new series of circles. I'm so excited for what God wants to do in my life, in your life, as we jump further into this, this topic of, of the expansiveness of God, of his kingdom, of what he wants to do in and through our lives. And, and this series is, is about you and I really grabbing a hold of God and grabbing a hold of this concept of, of the expansive. It's about letting God be God in our lives so that he, his expansiveness can come through our lives to the world. It is for his glory. And I want you to, to commit, right, to being engaged. We've got seven sessions, including the Zoom call, seven sessions. And I want you to commit to being present, to being engaged, to being a conversation starter in your circle. Okay, because the, 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 the level at which we engage with this stuff is kind of determines the level of, of change and the level of impact it has on our lives. And so I want us to engage. I want us to engage. So experiencing expansive. I don't think it's any myth, right? I don't think it's a surprise that there are a lot of people who live their lives. There are a lot of followers of Jesus who live their lives and never fully see all there is to see. They never fully experience all there is to experience. Uh, like I, I see and I've heard so many stories of people who who knew Jesus, but nothing really changed in their life. They kind of lived their life and that was that. And, and, and a lot of the time we can, we can put it down to failure. We can put, put like the, the lack of seeing the expansiveness of God in our lives, the, the lack of growth, the lack of fruit. We can put it down to like kind of, oh, I failed there, I failed there, I failed there, I failed there. And we, we put the lack of, of, of expansiveness down to failure. But when I read the Bible, I see men and women in the Bible who failed multiple times, but still saw the expansiveness of God in and through their lives. You look at Jacob, for example, who I've been reading in my personal kind of devotional reading at the moment. The, the, the man messed up on multiple occasions, yet he didn't fail to see the expansiveness of God in and through his life. And, and so I want to start by saying I don't think that a lack of fruit and expansiveness is, is down to an abundance of failure. But I actually want to put it to us, it, it may be, maybe, just maybe, it's due to a lack of focus that the, the inability to see the expansiveness of God in and through our lives is not down to an abundance of failures on our part, but a lack of focus on our part. You know, as you look through the Bible, you don't have to search very long and you will see numerous verses and, and instructions about focus, about where we are focusing, about where you are focusing. I'll read some of my favourites right, and these will come on the screen. Proverbs 4 Verse 25, it says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. It's all about focus. Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, who we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Later on in Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, it, it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith I could go on and on but the, the Bible is it, it implores us on on multiple times in multiple eras in multiple uh, uh, writing styles throughout the scriptures it implores us to fix our focus to be a people of focus we're constantly reminded to focus and, and 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 the question is why why does the bible put such a key emphasis on focus and i think it's this and, and this is a statement i want you to remember uh, from today's session it's kind of the foundation state statement is this is i what i focus on i feed what i focus on i feed and what i feed grows what i focus on i feed and what i feed grows Focus matters. I want to I want to tell us when we're thinking about experiencing expansive focus matters. What you focus on matters. What you neglect matters. Where you direct your focus matters on a daily basis. 
on, a, on an hourly basis. Where your focus goes matters because what you focus on, you feed, and what you feed grows. And if you and I are going to learn to experience the expansive now and, and this year, if this year is going to be a year of the expansiveness of God, we've got to learn right now to fix our focus intentionally and intently on the right things. It is all about focus. This session is all about focus. Why? Because what I focus on, I feed, and what I feed grows. And here's what I want us to do. I want us to hit pause. Will you hit pause? And the question will stay on the screen. You can pause on the, squ- on the, on the uh, question. And the question I want you to unpack in your circles right now is this. Are you someone who struggles to focus? Like, like me. Are you someone who struggles to focus? And then what helps or what hinders your focus? Hit pause when a question comes on screen. Unpack it for as long as you need to. Then when you're done, hit play again. Great. I, I want to jump into, uh, I've got two key scriptures for this session and I want to jump in to the first one, right? The first one. And this first scripture is in, in the book of James in the New Testament, James chapter one, verses 13 to 15. And these verses really show the power of where we put our focus. It, it really, it, it lays out quite methodically what happens when you put your focus somewhere. It, it, it lays out and you can see in these verses how what you focus on, you feed, and what you feed grows. And I want to put the verses on screen, and what I want you to do is, I'm not going to read them. Too often, we rely on the person delivering the the content to read the verses to us, but I'm going to put them on the screen for you. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 15. I'm going to put it on the screen. I want you to hit pause, and I want you to nominate someone in your circle to read these verses. Maybe read them a couple of times so you really get immersed in them. And then once you've read them, press play and we'll unpack them together. So read the verses, go. Great. So let's look at these verses in reverse. It's like a tongue twister, isn't it? So so verse 15 gives birth to death. So we're going to start at this place of death. Death is the opposite of, of expanse. Death is diminished, death is ended, death is, death, is, death is death, right? But it says death is a result of, of sin when it's full grown. And then it says that sin is conceived when someone is drawn to a wrong desire. So it, it, it says, hey, let's look at it, verse 14, people are tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. So, so, so people focus it is enticed and it's drawn away by a desire and when focus and desire meet it gives birth to sin which results in death do you see this a wrong desire a sinful desire you can't necessarily stop what desires come into you but you can decide whether you're going to give them the focus or not you cannot always control desire desire is not a sin. Desire comes in. What you do with that desire determines what it grows into. And a wrong desire combined with focus will give birth to sin, which will give birth to death. And when we allow certain desires to steal our focus, when I allow my focus on a a daily basis to get intimate with the wrong desires in my life, sin breaks out and sin breaks God's heart. Sin diminishes, it kills, it it steals, it destroys. Sin is horrific and we need to be hard on this. If we want to experience the expansiveness of God, we've got to understand that that the presence of sin is going to hinder the expansiveness of God's nature coming in and through our lives. But it's hard, right? I call it the desire dilemma. I call it the desire dilemma because it it comes into play when we have a strong desire in a moment. And what happens is we often confuse our strong desire in a moment for our deepest desire. What what do I mean? Uh, So at the time of recording, right, we're in prayer and fasting. 
we're in prayer and fasting. And, and my deep desire for this time of prayer and fasting, and my deep desire is, I, hey, I want to say no to things that I want so I can say yes to the person that I need. I want to I say no to some of these foods that, that I want to eat so I can say yes to God, so I can draw closer to him, so I can have my passion for him renewed. This is my deep desire for a time of prayer and fasting. But if I walk into a supermarket and I walk past certain aisles of this supermarket, not the fruit and veg, take that or leave that. I walk past the butcher, right, and I see some of these steaks. I walk past the, the sweetie aisle and I see some of these sweets, drumstick squashies, I'm talking Haribo. I'm talk, like, I walk past these things. In that moment, my strongest desire is to buy them and eat them before my wife realizes. I want to I want to buy them and eat these things. This is my strongest desire in that moment. But my deepest desire is still to get closer to God in this time of prayer and fasting to really ignite something new in my life. And what happens is when desire comes into play, we often confuse our strongest desire for our deepest desire. And when we we need to learn not to let our strongest desires steal our focus in that moment. But we've got to learn to constantly focus on our deepest desires. We've got to learn on a daily basis to, to turn our focus to our deepest desires. What are your deepest desires? I wonder if you can answer that right now. What are your deepest desires? Because if you do not know your deepest desires, you will always confuse your strongest desires for your deepest desires. I know that's a tongue twister. Maybe you need to pause that and listen to that again. But if you do not have a clear conviction on the deepest desires that you have, you will always confuse your strongest desires for your deepest desires. And this can lead to all sorts of mess. This can lead to the wrong desire and focus giving birth to sin in our lives. We've got to get to grips with our deepest desires. My deepest desire is to honour, serve, love and enjoy God first and foremost. It is to love my wife as Christ loved the church. It is to raise my sons to know who Jesus is, to be a great example of their father in heaven. It is to be diligent with the, the function that God has gifted to me in the church. Right? These are my deepest desires. And this is where my focus has to go on a daily basis. Because if it doesn't, my focus will go somewhere else, which will lead to all sorts of other problems. I hope, you, I hope you're understanding this desire dilemma. If you're not sure and you're not clear on your deepest desires, you're going to confuse them for your strongest desires in a moment. And this is where I think people will, will struggle with, with things like lust. They'll struggle with like uh, things like idleness, because in the moment, they're not got a clear picture of their deepest desires, right? And so I want you to hit pause right now. And we're going to talk about a desi desire dilemma in our circles, right? And I want you to, to ask each other and to offer up what are the deepest desires of your heart when it comes to your relationship with God and your, your, your function here on earth for his kingdom? What are your deepest desires? Go. Cool. Maybe that made you squirm a little bit in your seats. Maybe it revealed that you don't really know your deepest desires, but it's important that we get to grips with them. You know, those verses that we looked at shows what happens when our focus goes to the wrong place. It shows what happens when our focus on a daily, hourly, maybe even minutely basis, I don't know if that's the word, but minutely basis goes into the wrong places, the dangers that can happen, right? So it leaves the question, well, what do I need to do? What does, what does the focus of a healthy disciple look like on a daily basis? And, and for this, I want us to go to the book of Colossians chapter three. And I want you, I'm going to put it on the screen again. I want you to pause and read verses one through to three. Colossians three, one to three. It's coming on the screen now. Hit pause, read it in your circle a couple of times, and then we'll come back. Great. So, so these verses are quite well known by, by a lot of Christians. I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of Christians have these verses on lockdown in their memory, right? We know these. Since then, you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, set your mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. We, we kind of know these verses, they're, they're familiar verses, but what we cannot do is substitute knowing these verses for living these verses. 
Just because you know a verse, just because you know a command of God, just because you know a principle of God, it does not mean that you're living it out. I realize this on a daily basis, yeah? Like, just because we might memorize them, it doesn't mean I'm living them. And a healthy disciple will ensure that their focus is fixed in the right place every day. A healthy disciple will ensure that their focus is fixed in the right place every single day. 2 Corinthians 4:18. Paul says, hey, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Healthy disciples learn to fix their focus, not on what is seen, but on the unseen. Whenever I teach these verses, I always use a a lesson. And the lesson is, um, um, and one of the lessons I want to teach you right now, just a quick one, is this. Don't be a dog. Don't be a dog. Right, so Paul Paul starts these Colossians 3. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. He's referring back to what he's been teaching in in the previous chapter of Colossians about how we dead to sin, alive to Christ. We've had this change of life. God made us alive, right? And he says, hey, since you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, set your mind on things above. Except what's he saying? He's going, right, if, if Christ has given you new life, if Christ is now the source of your life, If that's what's happened, then make sure you set your mind on things above because that's the source and the substance and the sustenance of your life. But so often what happens is is we act like dogs. What do I mean? When I was growing up, I had a dog called Jack and Jack was a stupid dog. He was a lovely dog, but he was a stupid dog. And dogs and chocolate do not mix very well, right? Dogs, Dogs and chocolate, like, I mean... They eat a lot of chocolate. Best case scenario is they have toilet troubles. Worst case scenario, they die, right? They don't, it's not a great combo. Dog plus chocolate is not a great combo. And what happened was, we we knew this, but but the dog didn't seem to twig that chocolate makes him ill and potentially dead. And whenever there was chocolate around, he would go and try and eat the chocolate. And no matter what was going, we were like, don't be a stupid dog, Jack. Chocolate is bad for you. If you eat this, you're going to mess up the floor overnight and you're going to potentially die. But whenever there was chocolate, he was drawn to the chocolate. Why? Because he was a stupid dog. Love dogs, but he was a stupid dog. And, and, and when I was reading this years ago, I just jumped, that story jumped out at me. And I was like, wow, Sam, sometimes you are a stupid dog. You've been given life because of Jesus. You, you've been raised to life in Christ. You have everything you need in Christ. You have all of the, the all-inclusive provision available in Christ, yet you still go and focus on stupid things that lead to death, (laughs) right? And so before I jump into what I want to talk about properly, I just want to say, hey, don't be a dog. (laughs) Too many Christians act like dogs with this. We've been given life by Christ, yet we still go elsewhere to get our kicks. We still go to social media. We still go to drugs. We still look to sex. We still go to all of these different places in order to fill the void within us, even though we've been given life by Christ. It's time that we go, oh, if Jesus is the one who's given me life, I'm going to fix my focus on him on a daily basis, regardless of how I feel, regardless of if I'm getting the tingles of the Holy Spirit or not. If he's the one who's given me life, I'm going to fix my focus on him because he is a source and a sustenance of my life. It says in these verses, set your hearts on things above. Set your hearts on things above. And the Greek words are teo, right? It, 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 it's, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I say these Greek words quickly, so you, it's like confidence, probably said it wrong. But, but zateo, and, and it, it talking about to perseveringly seek, not just to observe, but in order to obtain. So when he says, hey, set your hearts on things above, what's he saying? He, he's saying, make sure that you seek, not just to look at these things, to observe these things, but to obtain these things. Set your hearts on things above. I love a, um, a few broadcasts ago in, in our EC Live, Gareth spoke about, he, he spoke about the all-inclusive provision, which is in the unseen place, when talking about Ephesians 1 verse 3. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We have access to this all-inclusive provision in the unseen place. And here, Paul is saying, hey, make sure that you seek so as to obtain the all-inclusive provision in the unseen place. We've got to perseveringly chase after. So often, I think 
for me anyway, I don't know about you, maybe you're way better at this than me, but setting my heart on things above, I can do it, but if I don't feel it work within a few minutes, then I quit. I often lack the perseverance in seeking. I often lack the stickability, the determination to stay in that place until I obtain. We've got to perseveringly seek the things above. What does that mean? It means I've got to focus, focus, focus. Some, you know, sometimes we need to put away our phone. We need to put away and hear this right. We need to turn off Alexa with the worship music. We need to get into a place of focus where we go, Jesus, I am not leaving this place of your presence until I obtain the peace that you promised. Jesus, I am not leaving this place of your presence until I obtain the clarity that you promised. Jesus, I am not leaving this place of your presence until I have renewed hope that you promised. We've got to get this level of grit and perseverance in our seeking, not just to look at these things, but so as to obtain these things. Let me try and illustrate this and then I'll throw you a question. I, um, I love shoes. It's, a, it's an unusual confession, but I love shoes. And, and there was a pair of shoes that came out once and I was like, they just captivated me. Please don't judge me. You've all got your quirks. But these shoes, they were like, they captivated me. I loved them. I entered, I think, about eight or nine different raffles to try and buy these shoes. And I'd spend time looking at them. And I'm not even lying to you. I looked at them so much that one of my friends actually bought me a painting of this one shoe. I just used to look at it. I, I, I was never able to obtain it, but I would just look at it constantly just because I wanted to look at it and appreciate what a good shoe it is. Please don't judge me. Pray for me. I need it. But, but, but so often we can treat the things of God like that. We can just look at, at, at the peace of God and think, oh, wow, imagine if we could have that one day. And we just keep it as some far off reality. Oh, imagine if I could experience the peace of God. Imagine if I could experience the... The, the, the hope of, 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 of God. Imagine if I could experience the fullness of God. Wow. And we just sit there and observe these things. But we got to seek after them so as to obtain them. I remember one Christmas, um, it was November the 30th. I think that's the day before December the 1st. Not great on how many days in a month. But it was a day before December the 1st. Suddenly realised we had not got the children advent calendars. And there was pandemonium in our house me and Misha were like, oh no. Misha was like, you said you'd do it. And I was like, I know, I'm a rubbish husband. Anyway, I went out and I was on mission in Wellingborough that night. Probably went through a few red lights, um, cut a few people up on the roads. But I was like, I am getting my advent calendars. No jokes, I went to four shops before I found the advent calendars. But there was no way that I was returning home without the advent calendars, right? I had a level of, of desperation and determination and focus in me that says I'm not leaving until I get these advent calendars. And I say that because that is the, the kind of determination that we need. That's the focus that we need in the unseen place to obtain the things that God's got for us. We have to look at the things above, set our heart on them, set our minds on them with a level of determina determination that says, God, I'm, I'm going to wait here until I receive what you've promised. I'm not going in here. I don't want to be drawn away. I don't want to be enticed by other desires. I don't want my focus to go to other places. I want to experience the expansive today. I want to experience the expansive in my life. I want to experience the expansive in my marriage, in my family, in my church, so that your name will be made famous in our communities. And that means I've got to focus. So on a daily basis, I'm going to focus on the unseen place. I'm going to focus on the promises of the unseen place. I'm going to focus on the person in the unseen place. I am going to focus, focus, focus. Because the right focus in the right place will lead to the expansiveness of God being experienced. I want you to pause for a question before I kind of close everything. And my final question is this. What barriers do I need to break down in order to focus on the right things? What barriers do I need to break down right now in my day to day in order to help me focus on the right things? Go. Hey, out of these conversations that you've been having, I encourage you set a goal. If you've been in circles before, we use the ABC kind of 
model just to help us. It's a tool. It's not like you must do this every circle session, but it's a helpful tool. What have I become aware of? What barrier is stopping me from moving forwards and see what change can I commit to making? Set a goal based upon some of the stuff you shared. If you need to break down a barrier, set a goal that you're going to break it down. If you need to add something into your routine to help you focus, set a goal right now. Use these environments to set your goals in order to see growth and change. What I focus on, I feed, and what I feed grows. Let's not be like a dog focusing on the wrong things. Let's not be led away by different desires here, there, and give birth to sin. But let's be a people who focus intently and intentionally on the perfect law that gives freedom, the Bible says. Let's focus on the word of God. Let's focus on the all-inclusive provision that is in the unseen place of the heavenly realms so that we can begin to experience the expansive in our everyday. Fix your focus. What you focus on matters. What you focus on, you feed. What you feed grows. Let's grow the right things in our lives. I hope you found this helpful. Make sure you check out the tool that is attached to this session and I'll see you again in the next one.